enter the billiard pearl, your go-to destination for all things sales force. I'm your host, Inshu Mishra, founder and director at Billiard with more than 30 years of experience within the Salesforce ecosystem. Join us as we explore a day in the life of Salesforce professionals. From Salesforce DevOps architects to CRM analytics specialists, we will uncover the insights, challenges, and triumphs that define their daily experiences. So get ready for engaging conversations, expert insights, and actionable advice to boost your Salesforce journey. Whether you're looking to advance your career, streamline your processes, or simply stay ahead of the curve, join us on this exciting exploration of the Salesforce ecosystem. Let's get started with today's episode, focusing on a Salesforce solution engineer in healthcare domain. We have Laurie Tibbets here with us today, and we are so thankful to her for sharing her journey with us. So without much delay, let's talk about her. Welcome, Lori. Would you like to introduce yourself and let us know your journey from the very beginning within the Salesforce ecosystem? Hi, Inchu. Yes, uh, sure. And thank you for having me here on your podcast. So yeah, I came from a nursing background, actually. 16 years in nursing, bedside nursing, ranging from rehab, acute rehab, physical rehab, to like the small version of ICU in my local area. And when the pandemic hit, I, I really thought that I was going to retire as a nurse, but I got burnt out during the pandemic yeah. and I was so desperate to get out. But at the same time, I was looking for what else can I do where I will be challenged, especially mentally stimulated. You know, I really create mental stimulation. And I came across an ad about the Salesforce five-day challenge. I tried that. And doing the trailhead, I realized how fun it was and really was mentally stimulating. So I looked at the possibility of merging Salesforce and healthcare. And then I found Health Cloud. And that's when I decided that I did have a career to build in Salesforce in that sense. Although I realize now that you don't actually have to be in health cloud to yeah. work on your project. Yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, I started my trailhead in 2021 mm -hmm. and then I got certified in February. But before I got certified, I was very active in the community as soon as I experimented creating my simple first simple apps and more another app and then the experience cloud portfolio. And mm -hmm. I had a good network of meaningful connections, actually, because of that. So that by the time I was certified, it was easy for me to land interviews because my network were the people who were sending interviewers yeah. my way. It's, yeah. it's a very nice ecosystem to be at. So now I'm, like I said, I'm a solution engineer working at a big consulting company with Actually, it's a, it's trying to be tech agnostic as far mm -hmm. as the software development that they're doing, but my team is specific to Salesforce and specific as a health account. So happy where I am. <laughs> That's great. And uh, you would be able to use your health uh, industry's experience to, you know, understand the business concepts, which is like, sometimes it's very difficult for uh, a person coming from a technical background to understand. So yeah, it's actually a win-win situation for both the employer and the employee that, you know, employer can gain some ideas from your experience and you can actually contribute and start learning a different skill set while actually building uh, on top of your different skill set that is non-technical. So that's great. And yeah, thanks for sharing your journey with us. Would you be able to, you know, walk us through a typical day in your role as a Salesforce solution engineer and particularly within the healthcare domain? Yeah, sure. So what I'm working on is a project that is huge, really huge, as in there are at least 30 custom apps. And I'm working on just one app. And this one app is still huge compared to the other apps that the other teams are working on. So we use the Agile methodology to develop the app. And because the particular project that I'm in, it has been running for more than 
a year. I believe it's on the third year now. Right. And we are doing a release, like there are, there are four work streams, what we call work streams. And we're doing the release of each work stream one time. But at the same time, the ones that we released already, we are working on enhancements. So a typical sprint duration can, well, it's when I started, it was like three weeks. Then there were talks of making it like two weeks, but then we ended up making it four weeks total. So a typical day for me would be once we started the sprint, then I would start my solutioning. And the first few days of the sprint is very busy. So we would have a daily stand up in the morning. We have office hours, not every day, but maybe twice a week. But in between those uh, established meetings, I can also so, um, tap someone else for collaboration or mm -hmm. for clarification. A lot of times I might reach out to my solution architect or the lead developer in my team, or I might work together with the custom coder developer. So my title as a solution engineer is really a, a fancy title for declarative development. <laughs> so in my small team, small team of four teams, we do have two solution engineers, two developers, a BA, QA engineer. UX UI team. So uh, we do have a lot of discussions going on. And if I need to clarify something, I just tap whoever, maybe hop on a call or just exchange messages in the chat. So that's how a typical day would work for me. And then towards in like every two weeks, we would have like backlog refinement for the future tickets that we might be working on in the future sprints. So that could also be part of my day. And towards the end of the sprint, we do have the sprint retrospective where we review what went well, what we could improve on and such thing. How is your role? Like, like you said that it was, it was a fancy title and that's why we were interested in learning more about it. So how do you think that solution engineer is different uh, from a standard developer or an admin um, role? Would you be able to share something? So the solution engineer is almost like an admin mm -hmm. in the sense that admins can be expected to do some configurations, you know, yeah. but in, in my case, as a solution engineer, I don't really administer a, an org, but I yeah. do implementation. So things like I might create a new field or replace a field or rearrange a page layout or assign permissions or edit a flow. <laughs> so yeah. those things are, are my main tasks as a solution engineer. When we do like backlog refinement, they want my, as a solution engineer, they want my perspective as to can, can this be done declaratively? And usually, of course, the Scrum Master facilitates that, but most really of the discussion is facilitated by the BA and the business analyst might have to edit the description and acceptance criteria because as we are discussing them, I would already imagine in my head how I would configure it in the Salesforce org. And I might also have my org open just so I know how to ask the appropriate questions during backlog refinement. That yeah. way, when the sprint starts, I know exactly what I need to do. But that doesn't mean that there might not be any more edits mm -hmm. that I might yeah. suggest to the BA. Because yeah. sometimes when you're working already on the solutioning, then you discover that, okay, this acceptance criteria is impossible for me to do unless, you know, something like that. So yeah, that's part of what my usual tasks and responsibilities are when it comes to my role as a solution engineer. And, and I do have like, sometimes I'm not sure whether, okay, is this a declarative uh, solution or do we need some custom coding? Like maybe a lightning web component is needed, which in my company, that will be the domain of custom coder. So I would 
tap the solution architect in my team and I would present to him my issue about that. And then he would know better mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a custom code or a declarative one, especially if he looks at the higher environment and mm -hmm. in the higher environments, we don't really have access as system admin. We only test the end user, but in the sandboxes, um, that's where we have um, access. But the solution architects know more about the, the overview of the processes that's already in place. So I just reach out to the solution architect for that clarification. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing, Matt. So would you be able to share a few challenges that you come across in your day-to-day -day life if you would like to? highlight one particular challenge, what would that be? And what is your strategy to overcome those challenges? Well, I would say that the most challenging part of working on this huge project really is keeping in mind that what I'm working on is only one app of many, and it's all in one board. So it's a multi-tenancy oh. issue, and I cannot just proceed with the permission without verifying that this is this really the right permission that we need to assign, you know, mm -hmm. because the solution architects will know more about that, especially that when I came to this project, it was already about a year old. Mm -hmm. So I had, I, I had come sort of midway already. And at the time I was trying to keep up with what's already in place. So, and, and a lot of times I would just to make sure and, and to play it safely, I would need to really verify with the solution architect, whether mm -hmm. I'm giving the correct permissions because we don't want the wrong users access to the app or the information that you're working on. Yeah. So that's challenging. Yeah. My next question is, how do you stay updated? Because, you know, a Salesforce ecosystem is ever evolving. There are so many releases happening. So what is your strategy to stay updated on the latest Salesforce features, updates? And how do you come across the best practices? So do you have uh, a strategy to, you know, go to a particular um, forum or, you know, just going through the trailhead? How do you stay up to date? Yeah, a lot of times I would wait for something like Spring 24 release, something like that. And I would read mm -hmm. articles, usually blog articles, especially Salesforce Ben is very good at that. So I will read such articles or attend webinars that are hosted sometimes by Trailblazer community groups. Yeah. They would present these new releases and whatever updates are. And, you know, I would know which ones are already generally available or will come out in so-and-so whatever time in the future. Yeah. Uh, also, in my company, uh, we have like weekly meetings for, let's say, solution ar architects slash solution engineers. And then we have mm -hmm. like community of practice. We have monthly information sharing. So sometimes um, the topics for those meetings would be in relation to those um, updates and new releases. That makes sense. Thanks for sharing that. And I, I know that the webinars conducted by Trailblazer communities are really insightful. So do you have any particular community webinar link that you would like to share with our viewers or listeners? To be honest, I joined a lot of Trailblazer community groups even yeah. if, let's say, they're based in Chicago or mm -hmm. in Australia. Yeah. Once yeah. I see, because sometimes what I would do, especially during the time that in-person events were not yet popular because of the COVID, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. for a lot of Trailblazer community groups that were holding webinars mm -hmm. and they had a lot of sessions that would be interesting to me. And so I signed up for those um groups. So that's, that's why I ended up being a member of a lot of them. And then mm -hmm. so I would see on my feed what the discussions are, or I would get an email if there's a new event they are holding. So 
on email, if I see it as a virtual event and um, it's interesting to me, and then I register, right? So yeah. in regards to those, so like I said, it's really not specific. But what I did was I joined admin groups. I joined consultant groups. I joined even like the solution architects group, I believe in Orlando, Florida today. But that one I joined because um, in my network, some of the uh, some connections I have are leaders of these trailblazer or community groups. So I would see their post on LinkedIn about the webinar that they're holding. And I would see that, oh, there's a virtual um, option because now some of them are a hybrid type of sessions. Mm -hmm. So I would sign up for those. And, and that's also a very good way of increasing your network. And the reason also that I joined, let's say, this Solution Architect community is because mm -hmm. I want to have an idea of what did they do as a Solution Architect, right? Plus also establishing that meaningful connection. So whenever I would see them post about that, then I also would share on my LinkedIn profile so that my network will also know about this interesting webinar. And it so happened too that if I do something like that, the leaders of the community group are happy that I'm sharing what, you know, what they're holding. Because I know that it takes a lot to organize such events yeah. and that's my way of thanking them. Mm -hmm. So I try to be as active as my work schedule would allow. <laughs> so yeah. It is appreciated. It's my way of appreciating them for their knowledge sharing. And I also appreciate, I, they also appreciate me for doing that. Yeah. And that's a really good way because then, because you are actually networking by doing that. And if you do such thing, people also want to thank you in, in some other ways. So say, for example, if there is a job opening or maybe if they come across any, you know, an opportunity that would be um, relevant to you, they would then directly message you that, are you interested in that? So those are the things that happen with me that if I... Like do a simplest task of, you know, just sharing that post. Uh, I was contacted by a person when they had told me about this certification voucher that, that was available. And I was like glad to have that certification voucher and do one of my certifications. So those are the things that happen when you start networking. And I think LinkedIn and Trailblazer communities, they are the best platforms to actually go out there and showcase your skills there. And, Network with like-minded individuals. So that's a very good way uh, yeah, to keep yourself updated. Because when you help others, people actually want to help you out. And that's how we progress in any of the field. And the beauty about Salesforce ecosystem is that we've got so many helpful individuals out there. <laughs> We're just mm -hmm. waiting for you to ask. <laughs> right, right. So, Oh, and yeah. you mentioned supporting each other and yeah. really networking and you talked about the vouchers. So I was a, a lead in the Healthcare Heroes cohort of Salesforce mm -hmm. Talent Alliance Career Cohort for the past year. In this program, the Talent Alliance Career Cohort, if you have in the audience, if you have some people who are just beginning their journey, they might want to sign up for right. the Talent Alliance Career Cohort. Although now I'm not sure that it's open to outside of America. But I do know uh, this is for the underrepresented community. Although I believe it was because they were trying to also grow the number of people who who have background in, in the health and life sciences. So they included the Healthcare Heroes Cohort. Now, if, say, someone from your audience participates in the Talent Alliance Career Cohort, uh, they will end up um, being invited to Trailhead Coach. And the Trailhead mm -hmm. Coach allow for free vouchers. If you finish, let's say, the trail mix that's required for, let's say, the admin, then mm -hmm. you finish that trail mix and you get the voucher for the certification exam for admin. 
And you can do that with other certifications that you want to pursue. So yeah. you might, you might want your audience to join TACC if, if they can. Yeah, that's great. If you're listening to it, if you're watching us, the link will be provided in the description for Talent Alliance. If you want to go and gain something from their journey, just go and follow them. So we, moving on, we would like to know if there is any memorable success story and if there are any lessons that you would like to share with us from that experience. As far as a uh, success story, I, I don't really mm -hmm. have a uh, direct contact with the clients, but mm -hmm. I do, I do read because I am essentially a contractor for the client. So mm -hmm. I get access to their emails and sometimes I would see the newsletter about mm -hmm. how the end users are very satisfied with the project so far, you know, with mm -hmm. the user how it's improved their workflow. Mm -hmm. So uh, that already is, to me, a success. What happens also is sometimes during lunch and learn or town hall sessions in our company, the leadership mm -hmm. um, present the statistics of the various projects that we've been working on and uh, share with us the, the wins because our leadership, they want us to know that every single little work that we do really matters. So. Yeah. That's good enough for me. And thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so moving on to our next question, would you be able to share insights into your certification journey and how it has impacted uh, your career? Yeah. So in my company, actually, we have a list of certifications that are incentivized. This has more to do with how we will be better able to implement what we need to implement. So let's say instead sales cloud, which we don't use, we encourage doing the service cloud and experience cloud, you know, those things. And there are other certifications and the monetary incentive really is a good incentive and it varies on what level of certificate, but not only the monetary incentive, we also can build our case for promotion when we do get those additional certificates, which makes it more mm. enticing to go after a certain certificate. And of course, you gain more understanding. Let's say um, I never really considered taking any architect mm. uh, certification before, but having been exposed to this um, big project that is an enterprise level, um, it it gave me a better perspective of the project and a better understanding of what we're trying to build and what we need to respect, let's say, uh, of governance, something about governance, which still to me is an abstract concept, but are often brought up by the, the technical architects, you know, some things like that and security issues and integrations, you know. So I love learning more by also targeting those certifications. That way I, I have a better uh, appreciation for the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so That's far, really um, I did, I did get, like I said, like I told you earlier about the development part yeah. <laughs> in my role as a declarative developer, sometimes I feel so inadequate, not really understanding things like apex triggers and, yeah. and letting yeah. up. So I, because I started with this low code, no code work as a solution mm -hmm. engine, um, and I have, let's say in the, in flow, a lot of my friends who are developers say that mm -hmm. if you do understand both, mm -hmm. then you're already understanding some of the code concepts and it should make it easier for you to, to get into the development. So I'm hoping that that is true. <laughs> so yeah. I started my journey into the development mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm hoping to get the PD one eventually. And that's not incentivized. I mean, that's not part of the certifications that have monetary incentives mm -hmm. in my company, but for my mm -hmm. own personal upskilling and mm -hmm. personal satisfaction, I want to get into that mm -hmm. just so I can understand better what the custom coders are doing and not and be too dependent. Great. Yeah, like you said, you started as 
um, you know, from a different background coming to the tech industry and you started as a no-code, no-code developer. Now you are getting into that in your technical domain because initially you might not be interested in exploring that area, but now after working for so long in the ecosystem, you have that interest of learning more. So you never know how, when you get into the tech industry, what sort of, you know, interest you come across, which you were not aware of before entering the tech industry. And that's the beauty of the Salesforce ecosystem that we are trying to highlight. That even if you were thinking that it's not for you, now, after two years, the story could be entirely different. So, mm-hmm. yeah, go for it. Like Lori said that her journey was entirely from a different background coming to Salesforce. And now she is going to explore the development path and she would be taking PD1 certification. That is really the push. <laughs> or if you don't know about it, it's, it takes some time to actually get there. So like she did, you can also do that. Just get into the ecosystem, whatever opportunity you get, and you'll be able to thrive. Thanks for sharing that, Lori. So now moving on, we would like to know, in your opinion, what trends do you see on the horizon for Salesforce professionals? And how can those entering the field prepare for the future? If you have any advice that you would like to share? Yeah, well, as you, as we all know, AI is big. Yeah. So there's no way, there's no way around that. You will, it, it is inevitable. So I would suggest that um, people who are entering into the ecosystem um, don't see AI as something that will take away jobs. <laughs> it's a yeah. tool. So consider yeah. it as such. You can be good at utilizing the tool. And you know how with AI comes also something like prompt engineering. So they mm-hmm. might consider getting upskilled in those other areas mm-hmm. that has to do with AI. Okay. On other note, cybersecurity is always an issue. <laughs> and we now have the data cloud and life sciences cloud. So I think there will be a, a big expansion of Salesforce projects and especially in the healthcare industry. Healthcare is so slow when it comes to mm-hmm. the digital transformation. Mm-hmm. So I think there there will be an uptick in that. And I'm hoping that there will be a lot of AI applications that will be adopted by the healthcare industry because let's just say something like, uh, let's say a patient calls a crisis center because a patient mm-hmm. is idle. You know how it can affect the the person who's answering that call. Yeah. It's hard to, to put yeah. our emotions in check, right? But with mm-hmm. AI, proper training of an AI, the AI can... Mm-hmm empathically talk with that patient mm-hmm. and without being emotionally affected, that might result in a negative outcome, you know? So it, it's a more efficient use of AI if, if we use AI in that manner and that will also prevent burnout of those employees uh, if they are able to utilize AI. AI. Plus, there's a lot of shortage in the healthcare um, professionals. Yeah. So it, also help to address the shortage of these people. And that's a really good example because it can actually, you know, reduce some stress from the individual who are working in the front line. And right. uh, thank, thank you for sharing that. We come to the close of the conversation. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our viewers or listeners? Well, uh, for, for those who are like me, who transition from a totally different background, non-tech background. Please don't be intimidated by Salesforce. It is, to me, if you're comfortable using the computer, if you're comfortable using technology to to do your work, it is doable. Get into the Salesforce. It's a low-code, no-code type of development. And who knows, maybe later on, you'll get the, the courage to also get into coding. And you can do things at your own pace. And the healthcare industry, there are so many directions in Salesforce. So I would suggest that if you have knowledge in a certain industry already, that you leverage that. Um, so you can focus your learning towards helping industry that 
is the same as where you came from. Because then you become a subject matter expert. That's a really good advice. If you are listening, please follow Lori's journey. Get to learn from her. She is available on LinkedIn. And Thank you, Lori, for joining us and sharing your journey with us. Uh, being an individual from a totally non-technical background and coming here, learning everything, and then transitioning into a tech role. So thanks for sharing that with us. Thank you so much. That's it. And thank you for this opportunity to share my journey with you. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning into the Build Your Pulse. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. If you found value in today's episode, please consider subscribing to our podcast and leaving us a review on your preferred platform. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more listeners like you. Follow us on our socials for more resources and updates on upcoming episodes. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. Join us on social media, join the your community to continue the discussion and connect fellow Salesforce enthusiasts. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep growing in the world of Salesforce. Thank you for listening.